Galatians chapter 4, verse number 19, and we'll read two verses, and I'll pray and let you be seated. Paul said, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Father, thank you for your precious word. May it be real, may it come alive, and may it speak to us tonight. God, I need your help, I need your touch, and I need to hear your voice. Speak to us, Lord, and speak through us, and I'll give you glory in this church will as well. We'll praise you and we'll thank you for speaking through your word tonight in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. You can be seated. We have come to a portion of this book where Paul is really getting their attention. He has dealt with them on the issue within their churches. The issue is that of the tendency to forsake the grace of God. They have drifted back into legalism, Judaism. And Paul is trying to get their attention. And he is trying to get their undivided attention. And he is trying to speak to them and make sure that they're hearing him. And he says this in these two verses, My little children, it is a term that represents how emotional And yet how serious this matter is. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. That is my title tonight and that is my thought that Christ be formed in you. It is Paul's desire here that Christ be formed in the Galatian believers. I want to examine this idea of Christ being formed in us and then I want to look at what it will take for that to happen. Let's walk through these two verses line by line. He begins with those three words, my little children. He calls them babes. This is a term for immature children in the faith. The phrase literally means an infant and if you look it up in your Strong's Concordance it will say infant or darling. Darling. This is the idea of a precious little newborn baby. I'm going to need an amen right here. There's nothing more precious than a baby. And I'm going to need another amen There's nothing more precious than a baby until the baby's not a baby, but it's still acting like a baby. The preciousness expires rapidly. Can I get an amen? And that's really what Paul is dealing with. He says, you are my babes, my little darling infants in Christ, but we have a problem because you're not really babies anymore but you're acting like babies. You know, the beauty of the infant is not really in its looks. Y'all might as well say amen right there. Everybody talking about how beautiful little babies are. No, they're not. They all look like a bald Jefferson Washington. Y'all say amen right there. I mean, they all look like a little president when they come out, you know. Got multiple chins. You couldn't, you couldn't identify their elbow if you wanted to. Just pick a roll, any roll, and see if it moves. Their beauty is not in their appearance, but the beauty of that baby is in its weakness and vulnerability. The beauty of that baby is in its ignorance and its innocence. We are attracted to those babies 
because ultimately it is not their physical beauty because they're all wrinkled and they're all bald and they're just a little blob of nothing. Now they get cute in time if the Lord blesses you and all that works out. But initially we're not attracted to their beauty but it is their helplessness. It is the fact that we know that this little baby can do nothing on its own and in the heart of anybody with a heart there is a compassion toward that infant because of its innocence, because of what it doesn't know, because of what it cannot do, because of its lack of ability It's vulnerability. You leave it alone and it will certainly face harm because it cannot do for itself. And that is much the picture of a newborn child of God. But when the time for maturity has come, that which was once darling is no longer cute. When it's time for the baby to grow up and the baby don't grow up, the cuteness leaves the room quickly. And that's what Paul is dealing with here. He says, you are saved, but barely. (laughs) You are born again and you're going to heaven, but you are a babe in Christ. And it is a blessing to see newborn babes in the faith, but it is repulsive when believers refuse to grow up. Now, I made this statement a while ago And I want to read again, make sure I say it right. Much of the beauty of that baby is in its ignorance and its innocence. A baby does not know better. And it's cute that the baby doesn't know better. But when it's time for the baby to know better, we need the baby to do better. And it is to me, I'm just going to be honest with you, you know what's kept me thriving in this pulpit for 20 years, it is having the opportunity to preach to new Christians on a regular basis. I tell you, the most starchy, deadest, driest churches in the world are churches where everybody's been saved for decades and there's no new faith in the congregation. That is a tough crowd to deal with. But there is a joy that comes with new Christians who are babes in the faith. I get up here and fit my tonsils to the back door and preach about the beauties of heaven and the wonders of redemption. And there's old mossy back Baptists that'll <sighs> check their watch. But you let somebody get saved from hell and know they was going there not long ago and find out that they're in the family of God and couldn't get out if they wanted to and you stand up and say, all right, let's sing Amazing Grace. Ah, glory! It's tough. It's tough when all you have to deal with is people who are so in in a rut that they get over the joys of being in the family of God. And I love the innocence of new believers. And we've had a lot of that over the years. And we, we, God's blessed us. We seem like we have a steady crop. Now there, there comes problems with that. You have to deal with things when that. But, but it's a joy. And a, I'd rather put up with the problems than not have the problems to put up with. But I love it. I love the innocence. I, I remember one Sunday we were going to be receiving the Lord's Supper. And I, and, I, and I stood up and announced it. And I said, now next Sunday... I said, we're going we're gonna to receive the Lord's Supper. I got home that afternoon. A lady called me. She said, preacher, she said, uh, I, I heard you talk about Lord's Supper this morning. She said, would you like for me to bring fried chicken or pork chops for the Lord's Supper? Serious as she could be. I said, well, ma'am, I said, we've already got everything for the Lord's Supper, but you just bring either one of them over for the preacher's supper. Amen. No gift will be refused. Now, she didn't know. She had no idea. She had no idea. And I like that. That's all right. When you have new Christians, you're going to to have people that just don't have a clue. And that's wonderful. I love that. But here's the problem. The problem is when it's time to grow and and the ignorance becomes willful ignorance. When the Lord's leading them on and they refuse to be led on. We, we, we adore 
your innocence and your ignorance when you get birthed into the family of God and we'll rally around you and we'll, we'll ooh and all over you and we'll bounce you on our knee like a little baby Christian. But when it's time to grow up and you refuse to grow up, that which was adorable is now abhorrible because we ought to grow when it's time to grow. And you'll see that around here. There are people who started out just a real blessing. But it was time for them to grow. And not now through ignorance, but now through willful ignorance. They refuse to mature in their walk with God. And it's not, it's not cute anymore. Somebody help me right there. Now, watch this. He calls them my little children. My babes in Christ. Then he says... Of whom I travail in birth again. Of whom I travail in birth again. Now when I read that I thought to myself. What a vivid expression of Paul's labor in the lives of these new Christians. Now all the ladies ought to help me right here. That's a pretty... That's a, that's a pretty vivid expression of what he has invested in these people. He said, the travail of my labor in your life. And he's, this is referring to birth. The travail in birth. He's talking about those birth pains. He's talking about the agony and the struggle and the stress of, of birthing a child in comparison to birthing a believer in their walk with God. That is a very vivid expression. And understand, in Paul's time, they did not have uh, C-sections or epidurals. Somebody help me right there. I mean, it was just, you know, bite the bullet and hope for, hope for the help of God. That's all they had. So when he uses that idea, everybody that read that, they, and, and even us today, we understand the agony he is speaking of that was used in his own labor to get these people into the family of God. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand something that if we truly love sinners and if we truly help them come to Christ, it's not all going to be pretty pictures in the nursery. There's going to be some agony and some pain involved in the process. Every parent here knows this. I'm giving you late. I'm just, I mean, I'm just putting it on the tee and y'all ain't even swinging, all right? But I'll, I'll throw another pitch right down the middle over home plate. Every parent here knows that the birthing of a, that the pain of birthing a child does not end when the birth is over. That's pretty good. Y'all at least swung on that one. I'm proud of you. The pain of birthing a child doesn't end when the birth is over. But rather, from the moment that you have that baby, from that moment forward, there is a place in our heart reserved for pain and their honor from that day forward. You have, you block off a place to hurt for them when they hurt. You block off a place to mourn for them when they're sad. From that moment forward, that child not only becomes a part of your family, but they become a part of your heart. I recently heard a man say this, and I had to go back and listen to it to a few times to really get it, but I think there's some truth in it. He said this about parenting, that when you have children, your personal happiness can easily be capped by your least happy child. Let me say that again. When you have children, your own personal happiness can easily be capped by your least happy child. In other words, your personal joy in life, it will, it, oftentimes it can come back to your least happy child. By what they're going through, it somewhat limits what you're going through. It's hard to be thrilled about life when a baby that you delivered and nurtured and raised and loved is in the depths of despair. Can somebody help me right there? And so, you know, when we think about that in the family, that's true in the, in, in the family of God. If we really love the converts and the believers that God has put in our life, like Paul and these churches at Galatia, you know, it, you, you, you hurt when they hurt. 
You feel what they feel. Your heart bends when theirs is bent. Parents, help me right here. You're sad when they're sad. How many of you want to go whoop a boy because he broke your girl's heart? I mean, just just walk over and punch a 13-year-old in the nose because he didn't, you know, ask her to the dance or whatever. You hurt when they hurt. Somebody said, well, I live with her. I know why he didn't ask her to the dance. That's another side of parenting too. I get that part. But you do. You hurt when they hurt. You're sad when they're sad. You get frustrated when they act foolish. Y'all can holler, hey, man, the kids are out there. You, you ain't got to go home deal with this. You get frustrated when they're foolish. How many of you ever just like to ever snatch your children up by the neck and say, you know, life's really not this hard. <laughs> yeah, man, we about to have revival tonight. I mean, it's just really not that hard. Just do what you're supposed to do. And you really got to do everything you're supposed to. If you would just do some of what you're supposed to do, life would be so much easier. (laughs) We get frustrated when they're foolish. We get broken when they're rebellious. Well, it doesn't just break your heart to see your kids just stiffen their neck and bow up against Authority, parental authority, governmental authority, authority at school, whatever it is. When you see that, when you see that stiff neck and that hard look in their eye, and you know they just not going to do it for no other reason than they are expected to do it. Now, I've never had a child like that. Amy's got one like that, but I've never had a child like that. I'm, this is all stuff I've read. I don't know anything this person. But it does. It, it breaks your heart when you see them act, operating in rebellion because you, you know it doesn't have to be like this. It breaks your heart. Doesn't it worry you when they're wayward? When you know that, that they're going a direction that's not the right direction, but there's really nothing you can do about it but pray and trust God and love them through it. Now I want you to think about all of those emotions, good, bad, ugly, indifferent, whatever those emotions are, That's what Paul was experiencing when the churches at Galatia began to wander from the grace of God. He is writing this as a parent who said, I brought you into this world and I sure wish right now I could take you out of it. Paul said, you're hurting me all over again. You are making me go through the same travail of birth pains that it was when I, remember when we started in Galatians, he said, when I walked that narrow little trail up that rocky outcropping through that dangerous terrain and I came into your town and you didn't even know what the Old Testament law was and I sat down with you and I led you from Eden to Calvary and I showed you who Jesus was and that you needed him and I worked so hard to get you saved and in the faith. And I can almost hear the tears in his voice as he says, we went through all of that And now I'm having to go through it again because you are wandering from the foundation of your salvation. Let me say something to you. Let me say this right. Lord, help me say it right because I'm real good at saying things wrong. But Lord, help me say it right. If you have a pastor that truly loves you, he will hurt when you hurt. And he, he will be burdened when you're rebellious. And he'll be worried when you're wayward. And he'll be frustrated when you're foolish. And I feel that. I feel that here. When when I read this, I'm telling you, uh, me and Paul, I just want to reach up through the clouds and high five the Apostle Paul and say, I felt that. That is the heart of a pastor. And it's never easy. But I, I would really like tonight for us to transfer that kind of investment out not only in the pulpit but I'd like for you to feel that way about people that get saved here I'd like for you to feel that way about new converts I'd like for you to feel that way about the people that sit in front of you the people that sit behind you the people that sit beside you some of y'all have been sitting by the same people for five years and if I offered you a hundred dollars to write down their first and last name you just have to go home broke 
But there ought to be something in us that loves one another to the point that we not only know one another, but that we carry great burdens for one another. Now, it is a very natural thing for a parent to travail for their children. You mothers, especially here in my heart tonight, you, you, that, that pain of birth, that pain of bringing them into this world, though maybe not physically, but how many times in your motherhood have you felt that same pain in your heart for those children? when you see them making bad choices, when you see them going the wrong direction, when you see them hurt, when you see them rejected by others, when you see them making life more difficult, how much more do you feel that same pain in your heart? And here's what I'm trying to tell you. It ought to bother us when people that we have prayed in and people that we have fasted for and people that we have led to Jesus, it ought to hurt our heart when we see them wandering from the faith. You know, Paul dealt with this. really helped me when I saw this because in 1 Corinthians 4.15 he says the same thing. 1 Corinthians 4.15 For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul said, you can, have a, you, you can have thousands, tens of thousands of Bible teachers, but you don't have many men of God who love you like a father or many women of God who love you like a mother. And I want you, I found Holy Ghost is preaching tonight. We need that in our churches more today than we ever have before. Do you know what Paul's instruction to the churches were on how we are to treat one another? We are to treat the older women as mothers. We are to treat the younger ladies as sisters. We are to treat the older men as fathers. And we are to treat the younger men as brothers in the Lord. Listen to me. This has always been a family outfit in the eyes of God. We have always been instructed to operate like a family. He has never called us an incorporation. He has never called us a multi-level instructional instructional association. But every time he deals with the church, he deals with it like a family. And we ought to love one another like family. And there ought to be people in our life that we look up to like a father in the faith, like a mother in the faith, like a brother and a sister in the faith. And if somebody in my family got out, If somebody in my family ran from God, if somebody in my family threw their hands up and quit on the Lord, it would hurt my heart and it ought to hurt my heart when my family in the church does anything like that as well. He says to them, my little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I like the fact he had hope. He said, "Ah, you're hurting me, but but we're going to get through this until Christ be formed in you. Now look at that little statement, until Christ be formed in you. Somebody give me a good Thursday night amen right here. The ultimate purpose of salvation is for Christ to be formed in us. Y'all look at me right here. If if the purpose of salvation was to go to heaven, when you prayed that prayer on the altar, poof, you'd have popped up on a street of gold in glory. The purpose of salvation is not to go to heaven. The purpose of salvation is to be conformed into the image of Christ. That's why he doesn't take us to heaven right off the altar. (laughs) That's why he leaves us here, that we can be shaped and molded into his likeness. As I was reading this, I've got about four really good books on Galatians. And Brother Josh has helped me find several of those. And John Phillips is one of my go-to authors. If you're trying to study the Bible for yourself at home and in your own private, I, I highly recommend John Phillips because he's to the point you can trust him doctrinally. But John Phillips said this, The gospel is not merely a set of precepts to be believed, It is a person to be received. Did y'all hear that? The gospel is not precepts to be believed. It is a person to be received. See, you can be doctrinally straight 
and miss it by a million miles because this is not about things we believe. It is about receiving Christ into our life and having Him change who we are. I want you to go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and a very familiar text. To many of you, maybe the first time some of you ever see it, this will be a glorious night if it is. But Romans chapter 8 and verse number 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His, say it out loud, purpose. Come on, say it out loud, purpose. Come on, say it out loud, purpose. Now what is His purpose? Here's the purpose. For whom He did foreknow... He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, you'll hear a lot of people quote Romans 8, 28, and a lot of times it does not apply to what they're quoting it about. I'll tell you something, if you're down there trying to buy a car for 21.9% interest, and his payment's bigger than what you ought to be paying on your house. Don't go in there quoting Romans 8, 28. That is not his purpose for your life. Lord, I know you're going to work all things out for my good. Your glory. Hallelujah. <laughs> I always like it when Christians act like it was a miracle when the bank gives them a loan. That's what banks do. You know that, right? That wasn't a miracle. That's just banks doing what banks do. The purpose of our life is not these little these, these daily situations we run into, but the purpose of our life is that we might be conformed to the image of His Son. He said it like this in our text, that Christ be formed in us. Look at me. He didn't save me to take me to heaven. He saved me to make me like His Son. He did not save me because I had talents and abilities that he needed. He saved me that he might put Christ in me and conform me to the image of his son so that the world might see Christ in us and give them hope for glory. There's a word in Romans 8, 29 I want to highlight. The word is image. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now, that word image, I want to show you something tonight. That word image is the Greek word icon. That's literally what it is. If you have a phone tonight, or you have a computer at home, when you pull that screen up, it is filled with icons. Now, what is the icon on your phone or on your computer screen at home. The icon is a small representation of what's on the inside. So I look at my phone. There's my banking app. Not clicking that. That would be a depressing way to end the night. There's the weather app. Not going to press that one either. That would be depressing. I really don't see anything here. I want to, that, okay, there's my trail camera app. Hey, man, here's my deer. So it says spy point. I click on the icon and inside of that icon is the actual program. But it is the icon that tells me what to expect when I open it up. Now here's what he said about us. That's a pretty good deer moving. Amen. That too was distracting. I, I got to get on task here. Here's what he said about us. We are to be the icon of Christ. We are to look enough like Jesus that the world knows if they open up our life, they're going to find more of Him on the inside. Oh, that God would put Him in us and make us like Him that the world would see through our actions, through our attitude, through the way we behave in good times and bad, that if they open us up, there's more of Jesus on the inside than what they can see on the outside. I've been sitting with Miss Pat Phillips, talking to her regularly. When I sat in the home with her on Tuesday. It's the first time I've actually got to sit with her. I should clarify that. But I actually sat in her home. But every time I've talked to her since this cancer thing began, she has been so full of joy, so full of hope, so full of victory. And she knows how severe it is. 
She knows what her odds are, but through every conversation she has, and I told her that day, I said, you are a blessing to me because you have every reason to be down, discouraged, depressed, and sad, and just losing your mind. But every time we talk, the hope of glory and the touch of God is on your world. Let me tell you something, my child of God. If the world can't see God on you, there's little chance they'll ever see God in you. I'm gonna say that again. If the world cannot see God on you, there is little chance they'll ever see God in you. Thank God if we go through those times and we lose our mind like the world does, what does that say about what's in us? There ought to be something on the child of God that no matter what we face, we have Christ in us and Christ on us and he is formed in us and we are formed around him. Now, I'm done tonight. The last part of this text, verse number 20, he says this, that Christ be formed in you. And this, he changes direction just a little bit. Well, not really direction. He changes his, his, the way that his, how he comes to them. He changes his approach, I should say. I desire to be present with you now. Watch this. Boy, I feel like Paul's mama was coming out in him when he wrote this text. And to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Here's what he said. He said, I wish that I was there right now. And he said, I wish I could change my tone with you because I stand in doubt of you. Here's what he said. I wish I was dealing with you face to face. How many of you know that people will say things when you're not there, that they will not say to your face. And they'll say it in a way they wouldn't say it. And these people had, had basically turned on Paul since he left. And Paul said, I wish I was back there. I'd like to see you say that to my face. Because I'm the one that led you to Christ. I, I walked you through the, the Old Testament, through the prophets until we got to Calvary. And now I hear all these things you're saying. I wish I was there in your presence where you could look me in my eyes and I could look you in your eyes. I wish I was there where I could get in your face and have this discussion. And then he said, and if I was there up in your grill, somebody say Amen. He said, I would change my voice. Now look at me right here. How many of you know that inflection and tone means everything in a conversation? That's one thing about texting. I, I do like to text, but you got to be careful when you're texting because you can read it in the mood you're in and that may not be the mood they're in. Come on. He just asked me how I was doing. And what he meant was, how you doing? And what you, what you thought was, you knew how you was doing. You thought he knew how you was doing. So you was mad. How dare you ask me how I'm doing? You know how I'm doing. Paul, Paul it's a personal matter. We'll work that out later, Brother Nelson. But that's all right. But, but that's what he's saying was, I wish I could change my tone. How many of you, how many of you growing up, your mama or your daddy, based on the tone in their voice, your nether regions begin to heat up automatically just by the tone in there. Oh, there is a whooping coming because I can tell by the way she said that. I can tell by the way he said that that this is not going to end well. I remember sitting in church. My dad, he didn't even have to speak. My daddy always sat up there on the platform as the pastor and I'd be, you know, our building was about this size and I, I thought my daddy wasn't about 40 at the time, but I thought that he was, you know, legally blind after about 15 feet. You know what I'm saying? I didn't think you'd see past the front row. And we'd be in the back or in the middle cutting up and carrying on and I, I, would, I would just, you know, just feel feel something burning through my soul and look up and he'd have him little beady Cherokee Indian eyes squinted down and I knew that he knew what I knew and I knew when I got home there was going to be a come to Jesus revival. Well, I remember praying for them services to break out and get good so daddy'd go home full of grace and happy. Amen. I was like, please, somebody get saved. Somebody give a big check. Somebody, oh God, if ever we need you, we need you now. But I could tell by the way he looked at me, by how this was going to go. 
And I could tell by the way my mom or daddy would speak what was, how this was going. And that's what Paul said. He said, I wish you could hear me. He said, I've been real, I've been real easy. I've been real kind. But I wish you could hear the tone in my voice now. Basically saying, I'm fed up with it. I've had it. Now watch this. He ends it and he says this. For I stand in doubt of you. I wrote this down. I thought this was funny. They weren't doubting their salvation, but Paul was. <laughs> Paul said, I, I want to testify. I, I'm not doubting my salvation, but I'm doubting y'all's salvation. Because you ain't acting like it. Now, here's my whole point in verse number 20. My whole point in verse number 20 is, if we are going to become mature believers, there are going to be times when we're going to have to, when, where we are going to be dealt with harshly, bluntly, and just as it is. And if you cannot come to a place of humility to where you accept that, you're going to short circuit the maturity that Jesus wants you to have. Now, that's not all the time. But there may be times in our life when we have to be dealt with real plainly. And where the preacher has to say to us, hey, look, this is what's happening. And this is what needs to happen. There may be times when other believers have to speak to us plainly. And, and let's just be honest, most of us can't take that. Because we're so full of self and we've got so many rights and, you know, we're somebody. But you better come to a place to realize that sometimes God and God's man and God's people are looking out for you. And you better learn to receive rebuke because there could be sweetness and salvation on the other side of a harsh conversation. Now, I don't like it no more than y'all do. But there are times in life when that's necessary. And Paul knew that it was necessary. You know, I'm done. Come on, to, let's do the invitation tonight. You know, Paul knew that, that they, it, it, it was time, how can we say this? It was time for the rubber to meet the road. It's time just to get this thing settled. We're just going to have to talk about it. We're going to have to fix it. And, and, and he's upset and he wants them to know that he's upset. And he's had it. And he's saying that in these texts. Now watch, they wanted to be babies. But Paul wanted to snatch them up by their collar and let them have it. And if we're going to grow in Christ, we're just going to have to grow in Christ. And we're going to have to receive those words of rebuke from the Lord sometimes, from His man sometimes. Sometimes, let's get back to that parent thought. Sometimes it takes tough love to lead us into maturity. And Paul took a tough stance with them, and rightly so. And he's snatching them out of that baby mentality. And he says, you've got to grow up and act like you've got some sense in Jesus. I had a friend that was taking a barely broke horse on a multi-day trail ride. A long ride, camping out, all sorts of rough terrain. This horse just barely would keep a saddle on him. And I said to my friend, I said, are you sure you want to do that? He is not a broke trail horse. He's an old cowboy. He kind of grinned and he said this. He said, he will be when we get back. And I think sometimes that's what God does to us. We're not mature. We're not broke, so to speak. We're not good Christians. We're not compliant to his will. We're not maturing. And the Lord says, all right. You, you want to do like that? We're just going to put the saddle on you and the spurs to you. And when we get done, you are going to be what I want you to be. Sometimes it's that way. But here's what I've learned. I've learned that on the other side of those difficult learning obstacles and opportunities, there are sweet lessons that I would not have learned had the Lord not dealt with me bluntly and harshly.